Today on Facing Life Head On. Hey, there's euthanasia out there, you know, and it's rearing its ugly head. In the most litigated pro-life case in American history, the battle over Terry Schiavo's life raged for 13 years in state and federal courts, in the state Florida legislature, and in Congress. Her story was thrust into the international scene when her estranged husband tried three times to dehydrate and starve her to death. But after years of legal maneuvers and an emotional and widely publicized conflict between her parents and her husband, Terry Schindler Schiavo died March 31, 2005 at this hospice in Pinellas Park, Florida. To the family who loved her, the end was only the beginning. Just 26 years old when she collapsed in the middle of the night, Terry Schiavo suffered brain damage from a loss of oxygen. Soon after, her husband, Michael Schiavo, stopped her therapy, saying he believed she was in a persistent vegetative state in a coma, kept alive only by artificial means. That started more than a decade of legal battles. As the Schindlers discuss in their book, even though she could no longer feed herself, Terry Schiavo was still very much alive. Michael's lawyer, George Filos, he made comments to the public that uh, they just wanted uh, Terry's future to follow natural courses, that, that she die naturally. What do you have to say to that? What does he mean by naturally? Let nature take its course. Well, then he should have let nature take its course mm -hmm. then. You know, as far as I'm concerned, what it means by nature take its course is that when she's ready, God will take her. I don't think that's what he did. Terry wasn't dying. She was fine. Terry had brain severe brain See, injury. That's the misconception and the frustration is that uh, they had a PR firm working for them. Felix hired a PR firm. And they were out there uh, and they were spreading uh, misinformation to people. Terry could breathe and communicate, but her husband continued to push for the removal of the feeding tube that gave Terry food and water. In April 2001, he succeeded. Outraged, her parents and siblings sought and won a court order to reverse Michael Schiavo's actions. It was the first time Terry's life was saved. But for the next two and a half years, her husband and her family battled in court. And again, Michael had Terry's feeding tube removed. Well, I, I would go in there. She was without food and water the second time for seven days. And here she would be in bed, all covered up. First of all, she'd have corduroy um, pants on and a heavy sweater and it would be around her neck. And then she'd have all these blankets on her. And she'd be so hot, her face would be beat, beat red. And she never had any water, so it was like draining everything out of her. And I'd just take those covers and I'd pull them off her. You know, and she was as hot as could be. I, I used to get so upset because I knew that, well, I knew what they were doing to her. You know, three nights, three or four nights, I went in there in the same, exact thing every single night. This time, under executive order of Governor Jeb Bush, Terry's tube was reinserted. Her life saved again. But the situation was growing larger than the Schindlers had ever expected. Unlike any other, Terry Schiavo's case was beginning to attract international attention. What made Terry's case so unique? Why did it capture the attention of not only the United States, but the whole world? Well, I, I think that um, God played an important part in Terry, uh, Terry's case. We had a lot of problems with a lot of the, uh, you know, judges and courts and stuff, but I think that God wanted to wake up this country 
and said, hey, there's euthanasia out there, you know, and it's rearing its ugly head. And I need somebody to help me. And I think he picked Terry. Because she, her feeding tube was stopped three times. And the first time, nobody really knew about it. The second time, it was getting a little bit more, you know, coverage. And then the third time, um, I mean, the whole world knew about Terry. On March 18, 2005, the court again, for the third time, sided with Terry's estranged husband in ordering that Terry no longer be given food or water. By this time, Michael was living with another woman and had a child with her with a second baby on the way. The case was so weak. I mean, it's so flawed and transparent. And the only judge that ever that was a fact finder was Judge Greer. And it was never reviewed. The, the facts of the case was never reviewed by anyone else in the court system. He never visited Terry, and we requested he visit her to see that she was responsive and that she was cognizant. And the guy is legally blind, and we had videos of Terry showing her responsive. That he obviously probably couldn't even see that. There were so many conflicts of interest in my sister's case, so many enormous conflicts of interest. Uh, Michael was cohabitating with another woman. Michael was going to inherit an enormous amount of money. There was doctors, several doctors. In fact, at the time of my sister's death, there was something like uh, over 40 doctors that had weighed in into Terry's condition and that she wasn't in PVS, she could have been helped. You had all these questions surrounding Terry's case. So why would any judge, why would any judge err on the side of death with all these questions that, that, were, um, uh, that were going on in my sister's case? You would think with all these conflicts that any, any judge would, would err on the side of life. And, and that's what most people couldn't understand, that, that Terry was being sentenced to death with all these enormous conflicts of interest that existed. When we return... Uh, today's the day that... Uh, Somebody's going to, you know, you know come this, in and help this us. This madness is going to stop, and every day she'll say that. While Michael Shivo confined Terry to a hospice room, her parents, Bob and Mary Schindler, and siblings, Bobby and Suzanne, pursued every legal means possible to rescue Terry. The Schindlers had exhausted almost all their legal options. Attempts by Congress and even President Bush to save Terry were quashed by the Florida courts. The Supreme Court refused to hear the Schindlers' appeal, and the Florida governor said there was nothing more he could do. How did you get up in the morning each day to face a new day to keep on fighting? Because I knew in my heart that when I went in to see her, how she was going to be. Nobody knew Terry, okay? Nobody could see her. Why do you think he didn't want anybody to go in to see her? Why do you think he kept her where nobody could take That's pictures? Her I'm talking about Michael. Nobody could take pictures. Nobody could see her because he didn't want her, anybody to see how she really was. When we went in there, I mean, her face, her smile, just the way she acted towards me, um, to all of us. It was, it was just like a breath of fresh air. She knew exactly who I was when I walked in the door. I didn't even have to get to her bed. I was standing at the door and I would say, it's mommy, and she'd turn around and she'd turn right to me and she'd start laughing. You know, we had birthday parties for her. We had Christmas, I, I couldn't wait for Christmas to go decorate her room. She used to love it, the lights, you know, and Halloween and the pumpkins. It so was it just. Was, it was Terry. Terry kept, Terry, Terry kept us going. Well, Mary, Terry. and I can tell you firsthand, but she believed every day. Uh, Terry. That it would never happen. Right. You know, I, I just didn't. You know, today's the day that. Uh, Somebody's going to, you know, you come know, this, in and help this us. This madness is going to stop, and every day she'll say that. I honestly believe. I believed in my heart that. that nobody would ever kill her, there, there, anybody. There's something, there's something uh, called a will to live, and, and a, a lot of people believe in it, and we certainly believe in it with Terry. I mean, the 15 years and what she went through, what she battled over those 15 years, the neglect, the, the, uh, um, the isolation, uh, and, and for, for her to survive, and, and even during her starvation and dehydration, she fought till, till, she, till she died. She fought with all her heart and soul, and, and no one can tell us that Terry did not have an enormous, uh, incredible will to live, and, and, and I believe 
uh, and that was that was driving us to, to do everything we could in our power to, to, to help you know to fight for her and save her life. One of the things that ripped Susie and, and my uh, our hearts out was not only seeing what Terry was going through, but seeing our parents have to walk in every day and see their daughter uh, being killed this way and not being able to do a thing to provide her any comfort or care. It was it was it was horrible, absolutely indescribable. What we were feeling during the the, the starvation period, during the dehydration well, period. When we have, ch I have a 12 year old daughter. I mean, when when you have children. You know, you, you will go to the ends of the earth to protect your children. It was gut-wrenching to see my mom and dad not be able to comfort her and actually have to t watch her go, watch Terry be tortured to death, literally, tortured by starvation. And that was just unbearable. Yeah, pe unbearable. People don't realize, I mean, there was policemen standing, they were standing over our shoulders, making sure we weren't going to do, I don't know what they thought we were going to do, but make sure that we weren't going to do anything improper. So, you know, they talk about this whole death with dignity. It, it, is, it, is, a, it is really uh, just, just more of the lies that are being told. Uh, it was just uh, um, a period in, in our lives, as I said, will be seared in our memory forever, something we'll never, ever be able to forget. I went in one day, and I, I, in her drawer, she had um, Vaseline, little, uh, those little Vaseline sticks, mm -hmm. you know. And um, the nurses were doing it, so I didn't think there was any problem. So I took it out of the drawer. This is in, in those, the first, second time in those seven days, and I put um, a Vaseline stick over her lips. I didn't even get it up to her lips when this policeman came flying out of the corner of the room, and he took it, and he grabbed it, and he threw it out of my hand. He says, what are you doing? What are you doing? And I said, I'm putting Vaseline on her lips. I said, they do it every day. And he says, you can't do that. You can't do that. And he just threw it on the floor and left it there. They threatened to arrest uh, the priest that we had there. They threatened to arrest him because he wanted to give her just a crumb of the host for communion, and they would not permit him to do that. On March 28th, days before Terry's death, CBS News published Terry's obituary, saying she had died a peaceful death. It was staged. It was a, the, the whole, death. Mm -hmm. They have to describe it that way. They, they have to come out and say that it was painless and peaceful. What other way, what other way are they going to describe it? People that would do something like this to a human being, what do you expect out of them? Mm -hmm. Do you expect them to come out and say, and describe it the way we saw it? Of course they wouldn't. Um, uh, so so th the people, the public should not be fooled by yet, you know, something else that they purport as truth. Be because as Susie said, what, Su what, what we saw in there was absolute uh, barbarism. It was just absolute, and, and again, it'll, it'll be these, in we, told our, we told my parents, I think it was two or three days uh, before Terry died, not oh, to go God. in the room anymore mm -mm. because of the way Terry looked and the way she was suffering. It was, it was just, it was, it was absolutely just horrible. When we return... I asked them to leave, let us be with our daughter, and they would not leave that room. Whether you're a student needing answers, a parent needing help, or a concerned citizen wanting to make a difference, Life Issues Institute has the resources you need to put your values into action. Life Issues Institute is an international educational organization committed to protecting innocent human life. Life Issues Institute knows what it takes. That's why millions throughout the world turn here for help. Life Issues Institute has authored more pro-life publications than any other entity in the world, and its materials are printed in over 30 languages. Radio broadcasts, newsletters, and a website filled to the brim with the answers you're looking for are just a click away. Go to FacingLife.tv and click on the link to Life Issues Institute to find out more about how you can change the heart of a nation. A brain injury 15 years earlier meant Terry Schiavo required care her estranged husband was no longer willing to provide. On March 31st, Terry died of dehydration after more than 13 days without food and water. She was 41. Moments before her passing, Michael Schiavo demanded that her family leave the room. He later said Terry died peacefully. Bobby and Suzanne, you were with Terry up to about 10 minutes before she died. Now, of course, Michael and his attorney uh, said in many media accounts that she had a peaceful death. Was it peaceful? No. 
she was suffering up until the last breath that she took. It was something I, I, out of, out of a, a horror movie, if you really want to know, the visual. Um, it was barbaric, absolutely barbaric. Even to this day, I, I don't like to describe it, it, it the way it is in front of her. I, I, I try to spare my mother that horrific, you know, image. image. Just moments after Terry's death, the family suffered another blow. They were refused a last goodbye. Her mother not even permitted to grieve by Terry's bedside. We tried to, to try to describe it as best we could in our book, so people just understood exactly, even even after she died, you know, what we were still subject to uh, at the hands of uh, you know Terry's. Well, I hate to even say husband, but 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 he was still doing what he could. It seemed to. Well, we had the uh, SWAT team in the room <coughs> after she was dead, and we, I had a confrontation with him. And I said, "What in the world?" I asked him to leave and let us be with our daughter, and they would not leave that room. And, 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 and they wouldn't let uh, Mary near... I just wanted Terry. to sit there for a little while, and, you know, and, they, and they wouldn't let me. No. Terry was buried at this cemetery in Clearwater, Florida. Her parents and siblings discovered the location only after reading a newspaper article. They say it was another needless act of cruelty on the part of Michael. The whole struggle to save Terry's life was an emotional battle between family members. It was uh, a high drama that many people watched. They have drawn people to the situation. How do each of you individually deal with the issue of forgiveness? It's something I know I can't do alone, and it's only, it's only going to be through God's grace and pray that I will be able to reach a point where I, I feel as though I, I will be able to forgive the people involved and in what happened to my sister. And, and it's a journey, uh, and, and I know in my heart that um, I will heal from this, uh, but to put a uh, put an actual time on is it is it now or will it be a week from now? I, I just don't know how to answer that. I don't think you can put a time on forgiveness. I think it's probably going to be different for each one of us. Um, but I I agree primarily with what Bobby said. I think it's on your own time. It's uh, a lot with you know your your faith and and asking God to empower you with the strength to forgive. I think it's very difficult to do that. Uh, especially the, the way, um, you know, Terry was taken. People lose loved ones all the time, but in, in situations...